Well, good morning. Thank you all for having me. It is nice to uh, speak to a crowd and see so many familiar faces. Uh, as Mike said, um, I think before I start my formal presentation, we do have to recognize um, Iron Gate only exists because of people in this room. So uh, Keenan Bernard was one of the founders and the late Gene Buzzard and then Father Jack Powers from Trinity. So without these three men, Iron Gate would not exist. Uh, so as Mike said, I mean, you guys are definitely the winners this morning. So uh, anyway, I've, I've told I've got a, a little while and um, the good thing is I can, I can talk a lot about this. So, but I will watch my time and love to have you guys, uh, you can interrupt me for questions, we can ask them at the end, um, whatever works. So, like he said, I'm here to talk about Iron Gate, and uh, I'll explain what Iron Gate is in case you don't know. Um, so, like I said, 45 years ago at Trinity Episcopal Church, those three men were in a Bible study class, and they saw a, a man outside. He looked hungry. They invited him in. They made a sandwich, and that's how history was made. So um, it's pretty incredible when you really think about how a, a random act of kindness can truly change the world. And I think that is um, one of the things that makes Iron Gate so special. special. Um, it started just out of a loving gesture and here we are today, 45 years later, literally millions of meals later. Um, so it's pretty incredible. So they made this man a sandwich they talked about it at night on the phone, and they're like, we should do that, we should do that more. And then the word spread, if you're hungry, go to the church with the Iron Gate, hence our name. So um, pretty incredible story. Um, three incredible men who started it. So our mission is very simple. It's to feed the hungry and homeless of Tulsa every day. And that's what we do every day, and I think that's important to distinguish. We really try and stay focused on that. Um, as you know, there are lots of social service agencies all across Tulsa that do incredible things. And sometimes we'll be having discussions and be like, well, why don't we do this? And we're always like, nope, that's not what we do. So-and-so does that, they do that. And so that really puts us in the position to help not only our guests, but other social service agencies. And I'll talk more about that later. So the issue is poverty and food insecurity. Uh, in Tulsa County, 15.5% of people live in poverty, and where there's, and that's higher than the national average, and we know um, where there's poverty, there's food insecurity. They unfortunately go hand in hand. Uh, one in five children in Oklahoma don't get enough food to eat, as you know firsthand from your McClure program that you're helping with. That's 220,000 kids. Um, and 31% don't have enough money to buy food. So what do we do at Iron Gate to try and help mitigate this? So our first program, which is our, how we started, is our community meal. So we serve a meal every day, and by every day, I do mean every day. People are like, do you serve it on the holidays? I'm like, yes, we do. Do you serve it on Sunday? Yes, we do. We got a team down there right now. Some of you have been down there on a Sunday, you know, but that always... Um, I'm always, well, what about, do you serve it on this? Yes. <laughs> every day really means every day. So we do it 8.30 to 10.30. Um, we start with a breakfast entree, and then we kind of roll into more of a um, lunchtime entree. Um, we serve anywhere between 500 and 800 plates a day. Um, that's also part of the fun is you never know how many people are going to show up and how they're going to eat and what they're going to do. So um, we have an incredible kitchen staff of about uh, five full-time people who are responsible for making the meals every day. And then um, volunteers are who serves our meal every day. So we definitely could not do it without our volunteers. Um, and then our second program is our grocery pantry. Um, this has been around since about the mid 80s and it's just what it says it is. We help people with groceries. Um, and then our third program is our newest program and it's probably about 15 years old, is our kids pack program. And that's where we provide these snack bags for um, children who either come in during the community meal or when their parents come to pantry, we send them home with that. So Iron Gate on Archer, I don't know if you have all been there yet. Um, 
it is about three and a half years old, but it still feels brand new. So um, we had a great team, people on this, uh, from the Sunday School class. Tom Maxwell led our construction charge. Um, he had um, just recently retired from Flintco, and so we just signed him up for a, another task. Um, so what's pretty incredible about this, as we said, we um, basically lived in our parents' basement for 40 some odd years. And while we had a great relationship with Trinity, it was time to kind of move on. Uh, so if you've ever been to the space at Trinity, we had about 5,000 square feet that were not contiguous, which is very important because literally the dining room was where your sanctuary is and the kitchen was way back here. So you had to kind of trolley the food back and forth, back and forth. So you can imagine the fun that ensued in that. Um, and then our dining room was literally in the basement, so there was no light and no, and the room was probably definitely smaller than this room. It was probably about half the size, and it sat about 78 people. So obviously a very tight quarters, um, and that's also where we did our pantry when we had pantry. So fast forward, monies were raised, a location was finally secured, and we found this um, property down on Archer next door to the day center. And we started construction on this building. And like I said, we had an amazing team, built the building. So we opened August 2019. Everything is great. We're figuring it out. We're in our building for about six months. And then it's COVID. And we're like, oh, this is no good. So um, the good thing for us is that we had this amazing building. We had everything was on one level. Everything we purchased was on wheels. Um, we had storage space, we had plenty of space, but now we couldn't have people in the building. <laughs> so we did a little pivot and we served everything to go during the pandemic. We would make our meals to go. We'd serve them every morning off the porch. And then, um, we did our pantry. We did it drive through. So just packed everything up to go and did that. So. Again, timing was everything, having the expertise of Tom, any kind of delay in construction, and we, we all know how that happens. You know, the steel is late, this is late, can just, I mean, in a blink of an eye, you're off, but thank goodness, we had no idea how lucky we were to finish our building in time, under budget, I might add, um, <laughs> thanks to this man. Uh, and then uh, we, we were able to open, and it also, you know, like there would have been no way we could have functioned out of Trinity just because we didn't have the space and the storage and everything like that. So, someone was looking out for us. Uh, so one of the things I am proud of is that Iron Gate did serve all throughout the pandemic without interruption. We literally did not miss a day of service. Um, and I always just like to remind people because now that it's, we've gotten some distance from it, um, you know, those first days of the pandemic when it's like, nobody leave your house, you cannot leave. You know, and I had employees like, am I gonna get arrested when I come to work? Am I, because we didn't know. And it felt so weird and so eerie, but we knew, we knew this was our core mission, feeding the homeless. We knew that if we didn't show up, who, who was going to feed those people? who was going to feed them, and we knew it was us. And so I'm really proud of my team and my board for supporting our efforts in that, um, you know, we did, you know, we had like the opposite pandemic experience of everyone else, because um, obviously there's no working from home at Iron Gate. It's real hard to deliver a meal from your living room. And so, you know, our team divided, we worked split shifts in case somebody did get sick, we would still have a team to carry forward. So we made that happen, and like I said, that's due to the leadership of our board. Um, we had the funding in place to take safety precautions and all that kind of stuff. So it's just um, part of our story that I'm very proud of. Um, so our meal, you might recognize some of those characters up there. I mean, and that was just last week. We make them mask all the time because, no, I'm just kidding, we don't. <laughs> We don't. That was, um, they were one of our first volunteer teams in back when we had people in the dining room. So we're grateful um, for the A-team, as they're known affectionately at Iron Gate. Um, so we opened the dining room again this year in May, and it's so lovely to have our guests back inside um, enjoying the meal. So as you can see from this bottom picture, what the dining room looks like, it seats now 217 people. Um, it looks kind of like a upscale food court. 
Um, there's all kinds of seating configurations. Um, in our old location, we, <laughs> we had the kind of tables that had the seats attached. So like you were sitting like this close to someone whether you wanted to or not. And so like just the simple act of having tables and chairs and we have long tables and we have round tables and we have bigger round tables and we have a bar and we have just all kinds of different because like I said, it looks like a food court and it kind of behaves like a high school cafeteria a lot of days. And it is very much a place of community for our guests. So they come in and they like, there's people that sit in the same location every day. They sit with their people, they meet their friends, you know, it's just like, it's like a corner coffee shop, same thing. Um, so um, when we built the dining room, we also thought about our guests and what they would need and how they would, you know, so one of the things like all of our bar height seating has plugins underneath so people can plug in phones i have a man who plugs in his wheelchair you know so they have that power access um, there's restrooms in there there's um, bookshelves there's um, we also have three social service offices so like i said we just do food um, sometimes you know, it's, uh, we don't always know someone's story because we, you know, we'll just see them when they need food and then they kind of go away. But through our partnerships with our social service agencies, it kind of helps us keep up with our guests. So we partner with Family and Children's Services is in our dining room Monday through Friday. They provide a caseworker and that caseworker interacts with our guests to help them kind of get hooked up with services. Um, then we other, then the other uh, groups that we have, we have Grand Mental Health comes into the dining room, Tulsa Cares, um, Oklahoma Harm Reduction, um, Mental Health Association Oklahoma, Youth Services Tulsa, to help provide services for our guests. So one of the critical things to know about our dining room is we are a no barrier. There is no proof of admission, there is no paper you have to sign, there's no, don't, you don't have to show an ID. Um, Part of our vision is, comes from our founders, is um, we believe we're all guests on this earth and guests treat each other with kindness, courtesy, and respect. And we believe that so much it is uh, emblemized on our uh, patio outside and, and writing for everyone to see lest any of us forget. <laughs> so um, that's really important to us is that everyone is welcome. Guests can eat as many plates as they want. Um, so when we serve 600 plates, that doesn't mean we had 600 people in the dining room. Um, so what we do to figure out how many people we did have in the dining room is about four times a year, we take a survey of the people in our dining room. It's real simple. We'll ask them like five questions before they walk in. We get some of the basic demographics. How old are you? What race are you? What identity? You know, da, 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 da. And so then we know, like, okay, on Thursday, according to our survey, and we always ask a fun question, like, what's your favorite meal at Iron Gate, or what would you like to see at Iron Gate? So it's not so, like, just taking the numbers. So then we know, okay, on Thursday we had 200 people um, come through the dining room, and we served 600 plates. So then we know that we're averaging about three plates a person. So then we can kind of use that statistic, and then we take the numbers again, and four months and so we kind of have an idea because if you've ever been in the dining room it's a very active place people are coming in going out going down the street coming back so it's very hard to stand at the door and count people so that's kind of how we figure out so every day we count plates um, so again the the meal um, made by our kitchen staff uh, they they do it every day um, most of the uh, food used to make the meal we purchase from a restaurant supply. We do um, use, sometimes we use me food from the food bank. It just depends on um, what they have available. Like right now, we're really big into um, Cornish game hens. <laughs> and that is because the food bank had a deal where you could buy 30 pounds of get Cornish game hens for $5.87. So I went to the chef, I'm like, how much room you got in your freezer? Because I can order 30 cases at a time. He's like, um, well, and so uh, he's learned. We like to play uh, freezer Jenga down there. How many things can we fit in? So that's why we look a little fancy some days when we serve our Cornish game hens. And then uh, the other good bargain I got at the food bank for the kitchen lately was we got... Uh, 
I think it was 30 pounds of uh, drumsticks, $18. A little spendy next to the Cornish game hens, but mixing it up. So there are, um, we take advantage when there are things like that at the food bank, um, because most of the food bank stuff that's available is more consumer sized and purchased. So when there are deals like that, we take advantage. And he's always a little scared, the chef, when I'm like, hey, I was just looking on the food bank. And he's like, oh God, what are you, what is happening? What are you gonna, what are you gonna ask me? But I do always ask, I don't just show up with it. So, um, but, so we do take advantage of things like that. Um, and so, uh, that's kind of, um, I'm trying to think, that's the basis of our, our morning meal. Um, people always ask if we decorate or if we do special things. We keep Iron Gate pretty neutral, so we usually don't decorate a lot. Um, just because we have a sensitive population, you never know what's kind of gonna be trigger on a happy memory or something for someone. So um, we don't usually do a lot of decorating, but we do like to celebrate with food. So we always have a special Thanksgiving meal. We'll do, you know, an Easter meal. We do try and do um, food related things like that. Um, and then the other thing I almost forgot about the community meal, which is very important. Um, so during the pandemic, we started a partnership with OU Tulsa and they have a, um, community medical school, and one of the programs there is a food as medicine program. And so we partnered with a graduate student, and she came and she talked to all of our guests and did kind of a health survey. What are your health problems? What are, you know, da 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 da. So the number one problem in our dining room for health self-reported is, of course, mental health issues. And so number two is heart disease and then diabetes. But mental health, far and away, I mean, I think it was something staggering, like 90% of our guests um, had a mental health problem. So we did that survey, and then they came in on the backside of our kitchen and took six random meals and did a nutritional analysis. Well, we were serving a little too much sugar <laughs> and a little too much fat and not enough vitamin D, and what was the other thing we were not hitting our marks on? So. Fast forward, so we're working with OU Tulsa and they are helping us reformulate our um, menu for our guests. And so the, th the thought is if we feed our guests better, they'll do better, they'll have a better day. Um, hopefully maybe we can keep them out of the, the hospitals, the emergency rooms, all that kind of thing. So one of the biggest <laughs> changes was we always served sugar with our coffee <laughs> and and sugar, you know, it's like, uh, some days I think there's more sugar in the cup than coffee. So uh, when we opened the dining room, I was like, okay guys, we're not doing sugar. <laughs> My staff was like, I, I, what, what? Are you kidding? there's gonna be a revolt. And I'm like, I'm gonna be the one to take the heat. So we opened the dining room and yeah, people are like, well, where's the sugar? And I'm like, oh, we're gonna try and feed you better or not. Da, da, da. And they're like looking at me like, you know, I'm like, but remember, we're serving coffee. Because, <laughs> you know, when we were doing it to go, we didn't have coffee. So things have kind of mellowed out. We still get asked, where's the sugar? I'm like, oh, we're not serving. So it's okay. So they're doing okay. Um, and then we have really tried to amp up, like, just on the easy side, like, making sure we serve a fresh fruit every morning with our breakfast, doing fresh vegetables with our meal every day, you know, doing a salad, doing steamed veggies, just some, you know. And so now we are getting more into the main um, entrees and, you know, doing, doing the easy stuff. We're not gonna become, you know, Whole Foods 360, Paleo, Kedia, you know, it's not gonna be, but we're just trying to do better. Cause we know if we serve our guests better, that it's just better for them. They can, they can have a better day. And then the other program that we're gonna start is where they've also designed these little, we're calling them meal bites, but they're kind of like a protein bar or a cookie or a ball. And so we are going to make them in-house and we'll send them out with our guests as they leave um, at the end of a meal. And it can basically act as a menu replacement. That's where we're sneaking in our vitamin D. Vitamin D is really hard to get, in case you didn't know. You gotta either get it through milk, omega-3 eggs that have been enriched, or like there's one other thing. So it's, anyway, so that's what we're trying to do. So I think that's a really important program. We've just started it and um, 
So hopefully um, that will see positive results for our guests. Um, our next program, it, well, I can back up. Does anyone have questions about the meal? Yes. Okay, so we just serve one time a day from 8.30 to 10.30. And when we ask our survey, we do ask people how often do they come? Are they coming every day? Are they coming three to five times a day? So the majority of our guests, I think it's about 50% do come every day. Um, it's kind of interesting, and over the last two years, we used to, when we would do the survey, we would probably have like 3% of the guests that were new that day. That number has increased to like I think it's 6% are new every day. And then we have, you know, the monthlies and the three to five times a week. Majority come every day. So. And do the, do the volunteers get to eat the, the, the special things at the corner stand? If, if they want a plate, they can have a plate because we serve everybody. <laughs> yes. 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 Can I hold that for my, I got a slide about that. Can I wait? Okay. No, you're okay. Uh, yes. 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 So we start with like a breakfast entree and we will kind of serve it until it runs out. Well, biscuits and gravy, of course, are the favorite, <laughs> duh. And then we'll, sometimes it's, you know, oatmeals with fruit or yogurt and a hard-boiled egg and a sausage patty. I also got a really good price on vegan sausage patties. <laughs> and nobody is the wiser, people. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> nobody is the wiser. Uh, so, yeah, so we do start with that, and then we'll go to a more lunch-like entree. So... Any other meal questions? Yes? Helps veterans. Helps veterans. veterans. So, yes, so the VA used to come to our dining room before COVID, and they have just not come back yet. They're a little slower to re-engage. But, um, and then we do know that is a question that we ask in our survey. So our average um, veteran population on any given day is about 12%. Yes? So early on, you mentioned Hungry, yes. So in our daily meal, again, from our survey, um, this number just changed a little bit. It went... Um, the homeless number actually went down a tiny bit. It's 88% are homeless. And for us, when we define homeless, it's that they are either, they could be still living in a shelter, but we consider them homeless because that's a temporary solution. Um, living in their cars, living on the street. So it's about 88%. And then about 12% of our guests for the morning meal are housed. And these are people who are maybe just stretching their, their money a little bit, some people, it's definitely community. I mean, they come down, they see their friends every day. I mean, they're eating, but they like to see that it's a social interaction. Um, and for a lot of our guests, um, you know, if you are homeless, you're hearing all day long, move along, you know, this is, you know. So this is a place where they can come and no one's going to tell them they've got to go, you've got to leave, so they can come and hang out and just be in the space. Yes? So the... Like, it's not even a percent. It's like less than one percent, which is a good thing. <laughs> so, and we know that because when we um, hand out, we'll hand out, um, like I said, the kids packs if someone comes in. And that is, out of our 25,000 kids packs that we do, it's less than a thousand go out through the um, morning meal. So out of the 200 and 26,000 meals we served last year, a thousand of those were children. So luckily, because kids should be in school at that time, <laughs> there are not very many children that come into the dining room. So. Carrie, are you going to mention the corporations that like trade Yes, I am. Okay, I got to keep going because you guys have, you're going to beat me in my own presentation. Okay, so grocery pantry. This is our other program. This, um, program has obviously exploded in the last couple years. 
So <clears throat> what we've done, um, we have a, what we call self-select pantry. So our guests can come in, pick out their groceries that they want, and away they go. Again, no barriers, no qualifications. We take basic demographic information, but nothing that you tell us is gonna disqualify you from getting groceries. So again, we take those um, numbers um, and kind of see. So in 2019, we did 10,000 households with groceries. 2022, we did 38,000 groceries. So, but not only did it increase, but the way we've done groceries has changed somewhat from 2019 to today. So some of those changes um, started in 2019 when we moved into that building. <clears throat> so when we moved into that building and we did our first groceries, we're like, oh, surprise. Um, we noticed that we had people who were unsheltered coming from groceries. So they would literally have their ID tag on from John 316, Salvation Army, wanting groceries. And if you're a no barrier grocery, it's hard to tell people no for groceries. But we're, we also were like, what, what are you gonna do with a frozen pound of ground beef? <laughs> and so, but you know, they wanted, they wanted to be there, they wanted groceries, you know, I understand that. So we kind of implemented a second pantry style. <clears throat> a pantry style of items that were ready to eat, they could eat right then, um, more of like deli items, sandwiches from Quick Trip, deli salads from Reesers. Um, so we kind of started in 2019 kind of doing this. That's a problem we didn't have at Trinity, just because of where we were located. But when you're on Archer and something is happening at a building, everyone who's out and about sees it and they come. And so, like I said, we, it's our mission to not turn away anyone, so we had to come up with a plan B. So we kind of started changing the way we did groceries a little bit. <coughs> so flash forward to pandemic, and <clears throat> one of the things, um, Mental Health Association has a building called Denver House. It's down on Denver. And that's kind of where they run their outreach programs out of. Well, that building closed due to COVID, and all of a sudden, the outreach workers didn't have food to take to people in encampments and on the street that they were meeting with. <coughs> so they called us, and they're like, hey. I'm like, absolutely. This is, the this, is, this is us. We're here to help you. We'll do the food so you guys can do what you do. We need you going out to do your mental health work. We're not going to take on mental health, so how about if I help you with the food? And so that began a great partnership. So Mental Health Association picks up probably 300 um, pantry bags a week that are specifically made for people living in encampments. It's all shelf-stable items. It is peanut butter, it's pop-top tuna, pop-top chicken, um, crackers, all this kind of stuff that, will, that can stay, that doesn't need to be refrigerated, that doesn't need to be. And so <clears throat> that kind of began a second way that we do pantry. So those bags are probably eight to 10 pounds. Um, and they come twice a week and they sp spread out all over the city to help people. So um, we do it for Mental Health Association of Oklahoma. We do it for a group called Housing Solutions. Um, we do it for Grand Mental Health, which is the old 12 and 12. And then we just um, started partnering with a new group on Friday called Be Heard Movement. And that's a group that has portable showers that they take around the city. So we are now doing probably about 500 bags a week that are going groceries to our unhoused homeless friends and neighbors. So that's, that, that's part of the increase in that 38,000 is a new way that we're doing pantry. And then, but the main staple of our pantry is um, families and working poor who are coming in. So, <clears throat> On that, so on that group, that's the outreach. I don't have a lot of statistics. I kind of have broad strokes, da, 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 da. But the part that comes into our pantry, you know, they do fill out a form, so we have information. So I know from that group that comes in, 60% of those people only come to visit Iron Gate one time a year. For them, it's a true emergency. They've had a doctor's bill. They've had 
a car breakdown. Maybe they didn't work all the hours they thought they were going to work. So they, it's a true emergency. They, they just need groceries right then. So that's 60% are only coming one time. I just did these numbers so I know, and it's amazing to me that that number has held. And then on the high, so our rule is, via the food bank, because we are an emergency pantry, that you can come visit Iron Gate once a month. During the pandemic, we're like, mm, we forgot that rule. Do not tell anyone at the food bank. <laughs> But we just were like, we're not going to turn anyone away. If people need food, they need food. And so we've gotten a little casual. But I just tallied the numbers the other day and looked at people who come more than 12 times a year. It's like 1%. So it's because people are, I don't think anyone in here, but other people are very worried that people are taking advantage of the system. Oh, they're just coming for, I'm like, no one is coming here for fun. This is, we try and make it fun, but it takes time. And it's a, if you don't have to come, you'd rather go to the grocery store. I mean, I promise you. But um, so that's just not a, that's not a true fact. People are not taking advantage of Iron Gate's hospitality. They're not taking advantage of the situation. They are truly coming when they need it. Um, so 60% are still coming one time. Like I said, I've got 1% that came more than 12 times. And then... Um, it kind of just, the numbers kind of, you know, then I think after 60%, there was 20% who came. I think my next category was like two to five. And then, you know, six to 10. So it kind of went down with every, as the numbers increased. So, and then the other thing that we know from taking these numbers is, so um, my veteran number in groceries is pretty low. It's like 8%. Um, it is interesting because in, uh, grocery pantry, we do ask if they're a veteran or if they're active. And um, we do have active military that come in. Um, and so that's, that's an always an interesting statistic to me. Um, and then 40% of our pantry recipients are children. So these are families that are coming in getting, you know, food for their children. And again, that's where the majority of our kids' packs go out. So we did 25,000 kids' packs last year, and about 24,000 went out through pantry. Um, so our pantry, it's pretty fabulous, I'll have to say. So, and like I said, in our old building, <laughs> we used our little dining room. I just think about it, and I'm like, you know, it's like if you don't know better, you don't know better. I mean, that's just what it was. But we would literally, like, set out the frozen protein on a table, and then we put the cans in the back, and then on this side of the room would be all the fresh produce and then we'd have the bread and it's like when the protein was gone it was just gone we didn't have any more we didn't have the storage space to have any more and it was just kind of like well that's what it is but in our new space and having the storage capacity it's just like a world of difference it is night and day so people come into a room and you know we have all the canned goods and they get to select whatever they want we have signs on depending on what we have in inventory and how much we have of things you know you can pick three things from this cart you can pick two things from this cart and we you know we don't stand there and monitor them <laughs> we just kind of let them go through we have little carts and then you know um uh protein so you can see in this picture where these white freezers are um we have a pork one a beef one a chicken one and a miscellaneous one and again, depending on how much food we have, like some days it's like you can pick one from every freezer or you can pick two things out of these freezers. So it's pretty amazing to come through and they get to pick. I mean, as Keenan mentioned, we pick up from Trader Joe's. Sometimes I have whole sides of salmon. <laughs> I have Wagyu beef. I mean, it is kind of crazy. The, I mean, just, um, you know, it's not just like, oh, it's, you know, the pound ground beef chub. I mean, I do have those a lot, but... Um, you know, it is, it is like you really get to make a selection. And so that's another reason why we're so excited to have people back inside picking their own groceries, because they can pick what's right for their family, what they want. Because even the drive through pantry was great. <laughs> if you didn't like salmon and you got the salmon, it was probably a bummer. Um, and then they go back out into our dining room, and we have our produce, our bakery, our bread. So part of the agreement with the food bank is all of produce is free from there. We don't get charged for that at all. And so our produce is usually, I mean, it looks pretty dang good. And so our guests can pick as much produce as they can use. Um, they can take whatever they want for their family. And um, 
again, I think my staff hates it when I show up because I'm always like, if you pickle, if you freeze, if you can, take whatever you need. Because if they don't take it, it's just going to go bad, right? And so they're like, oh, God, here comes the crazy lady. Um, but I'm always like, you know, because we just try and make it seem normalized that they're there for groceries. And please take whatever you can use. You know, bread. We have bread. Feral bread comes and brings us. I mean, we have feral bread like twice a week. And it's like, no, please take whatever you can use. If you can freeze it, if you can, whatever you can do, please take it. We are here for you. And so people are leaving grocery pantry with their carts are overflowing. I mean, probably 40, 50, 60 pounds sometimes, um, depending on if the Coca-Cola truck has come by and I have like cases of drinks to pass out. And they're like, really? Take us? I'm like, yes. And this one, like, we had little um, milk school milks one time when um, school closed down. And we had, I mean, I had like, this pallets like this. And so we we're like, these have got to go out during pantry because they have like three days left on them. And so this woman like looks at me, she's like, no, I'm like, seriously, take all you can use. She's looked, and she's like, I have six children. I'm like, let me get you some more bags. I'm like, I will send you all the milk that you can drink. So that's pretty amazing to be able to do that kind of thing is just to share with people our extra and our generosity. So checking on my time. Um, so volunteers. <laughs> I don't know who these people are, but you might. Um, so volunteers are crucial. So last year um, we had 1,600 volunteers. They did almost 8,000 hours of service. Um, we need them now more than ever to do not only our meal, but to help us prepare for groceries. Because um, before when you're putting things in bags, you just put it in. But now we like to merchandise it, we like to sort everything, make it look nice and pretty, and so that takes a lot of hands. So um, we have volunteer opportunities uh, every day for the meal, for uh, sorting pantry. So that is our other very important component. How do we get our food? Dun -dun -dun -dun. Here's the exciting slide. So it is pretty crazy. So. Um, we are under the umbrella of the food bank. We are a member of the food bank. So for our, um, uh, our meal, we probab it's probably about 20% of our food comes from the food bank. And a lot of that happens like when I see these big bulk things that I can purchase from them, like the game hens and the sausage patties, so that. And then produce. We use produce from the food bank whenever we can because as I mentioned, it is free, and we like free. Um, so that is in the kitchen. But then for our grocery pantry, probably 95% of it comes via the food bank. The other 5% comes from food drives, like shout out to Harvard Avenue. You guys did 2,500 pounds of food last year for Iron Gate, so that's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so food drives, and then the rest comes from the food bank. And we get our food from the food bank in a couple different ways. So one is when I talk about shopping. So there is a website that I go to that there's a portal and I can see what they have available. And <clears throat> it ranges, and some of it is, you know, I buy it by the case and some of it is very comparable to, you know, like a Sam's Club or a Costco price. It's a little bit cheaper, but you know, they're buying stuff at the food bank, like buy the semi-trailer full and then they pass it on to us. And then sometimes, like these Cornish game hens, like obviously somebody donated those probably to the food bank. And so they're just passing on to us like a minimum cost for storing and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, log in there a couple times a week, see what's available. We order from them every week. We pick up once a week from them. Um, and then we can actually go shopping at the food bank. And it's a little more hit and miss. You never know. I got a hot tip the other day from a woman at the food bank to go Thursday mornings because that's when they get their stuff from Walmart on Wednesday. So we're going to try that this week just to see what's there. Um, and then the other thing that has really just grown for us is these grocery store pickups. And so under the umbrella of the food bank, we are assigned grocery stores by the food bank. So prior, uh, you know, I hate to keep saying prior to the pandemic, but it was such a change in the way we did things. So prior to the pandemic, we probably, I think we had four different locations that we picked up from, 
and maybe we did like 10 pickups a week. So some of the grocery stores we'd pick up Monday, Wednesday, Friday, some were Tuesday, Thursday, whatever. So we had that, and when you get food from um, the grocery stores, we have to provide a very meticulous report back to the food bank, and we weigh them in like eight different categories. You know, we do produce, we do deli, <clears throat> bakery, canned goods. And so we send a report into them every month. So prior to the pandemic, we were doing about 8,000 pounds of food a month. That's pretty awesome, right? I mean, that sounds good. Um, so we're doing that. So then during the pandemic, some other agencies shut down. The food bank calls. Would you like to pick up some more grocery stores? I don't know how long you can have them, but I'm like, heck yeah. I am the girl who can't say no, <laughs> which sometimes gets me in a little bit of, you know, 10,000 biscuit trouble, but whatever. So they called, and one of the things was Trader Joe's. Would you all want to pick up Trader Joe's five days a week? Um, absolutely, 100%, yes, we would. So from Trader Joe's, we get probably 10 to 12,000 pounds of food a month from them. So then we are picking up about 20,000 pounds of food a month. And so you can feel very good about shopping at Trader Joe's. Winco, they're very generous. Reese's, Walmart. So, but what all that does when we pick up that food from these different things. One, like I said, it really increases our need for volunteers because it just comes in boxes and it's all mashed together. And so we need people to sort it. Um, obviously the produce is our, we got to sort that, get it out, it's got to go because it's, um, and sometimes this stuff is perfect. <laughs> I don't know, it got rejected from, I don't know, the buyer for some reason, but like it's fine. Other times it's, it's like it's got to go today. So we're fortunate in that if it's not a pantry day, we can slide it to the kitchen. Kitchen can do something with it. Um, or, you know, we slide it to pantry and, you know, we're like, okay, these we got, you know, if you want to have guacamole tonight, we have avocados that are ready to go. Um, so that kind of thing. Um, and then we just also picked up, we picked up the Walmart in Catusa and that has been, um, 15 to 20,000 pounds a month. So we're now picking up in between 40 and 50,000 pounds a month from these grocery stores, which is amazing because there is definitely a human cost to sending my staff there, using our truck, using all that, da 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 da. But the, it's still an offset on what that's saving me from buying those groceries. So that's pretty incredible. Like I said, food donation drives are um, a part. And again, the grocery store stuff and the food donation items are what I like to say kind of personalizes our grocery bags. Um, because on one hand, it's nice when we buy everything from the food bank and it matches and we put it on our shelves and it looks, looks like a grocery store. You know, you've got all the matching items. But then it's really nice to have all this stuff from food drives and the grocery store because a lot of times it's stuff we wouldn't buy. Um, like, you know, we get Trader Joe's coffee and cookies. Like, I'm not spending money on that stuff. Like, I'm only buying, like, hardcore chicken and, you know, green beans and the real boring stuff. <laughs> so when we get this stuff, it kind of adds that personality, and it doesn't look so sterile. So we love when we get that stuff. And then, like I said, we purchase um, for the kitchen is where we do the most purchasing just because... Um, there's not always that consistency at the food bank. We can't count on there being bulk items that we can use and that kind of thing. So that's kind of um, how our food um, is procured. Um, so financials, how we get our money. Um, our budget right now is just over $3 million. Um, about $1.5 million of that is in-kind food. And so we are raising the other million and a half. Um, and that comes from grants, from foundations, and that is probably over half of our um, cash. And then uh, individuals are a close second. Um, we have a very generous individual giving base, which I know a lot of you are a part of, so we appreciate that very much. Um, and then special events, which is also individuals coming to our events and supporting what we do. And then corporations and faith community make up um, the rest of our mix. Um, so that is, that is how our, our money is raised. Um, but for the pandemic, we did not take any government money. 
we did during the pandemic. We got two PPP loans, and then we received um, money from the CARES Act from the city and the county. And then last year, we also got some American Rescue Plan Act money from the city of Tulsa. So that money has been crucial in kind of this explosion of demand that we have. And so we're grateful for that, but we, um, we don't have any long-term government grants. And you had a question. We are not United Way either. So we did get a United Way COVID grant, but that was kind of a one-time special deal, but we're not a United Way agency. And um, I don't know that there's any reason, deep reason that we're not. Um, oh, I've got, I gotta keep going. There's um, just, uh, we, we just never have done it. So um, in-kind support, like I said, uh, last year, we got 867,000 pounds. And so this is from our grocery stores, all the in-kind produce we received from the food bank and then from food drives. Um, so that, that's a huge part of our budget. Um, and then, like I said, we changed things during the pandemic, but one of the things we haven't changed is we're still feeding people every day. So the numbers. So last year, 226,000 meals. Um, when you use how many plates, da 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 da, um, that's about 93,000 people that we fed. Um, our numbers are down on our meal a little bit from 2021, but in 2021 we were also helping feed two emergency shelters. So that's just kind of a, I mean, it, it made a difference, but it's it's not necessarily there are fewer people coming into our building. Um, one of the things that we haven't had yet that we're still waiting for, hopefully this is our year, is having a complete normal building, uh, normal year in our building. Because we haven't had anything to kind of, because we had split years, then we had COVID, then we were, you know, half, last year was half COVID, half in person. So hopefully this year we can kind of see what our normal is. Um, like I mentioned, we did 38,000 uh, households last year and about 25,000 kids packs. So we would love to have you join us, volunteer, donate, um, donate money, time, grocery bags, uh, food, or we'd love to have you attend an event. We have our Founders Dinner coming up March 30th, and we're celebrating uh, 10 years on that event. So we would love to have you um, join us in any of these um, endeavors. And if you have any questions, you can call me. I'll answer right now. Yes. Yes, we have a head chef. Um, we just hired him um, at the end of the year. He came from Post Oak Lodge, and we're happy to have him. And so he creates the menu every week with his team. And, um, you know, they kind of do it based on <laughs> what crazy things I purchased. Yes, yes. And then um, because of all the influx of food that we're getting, um, one of your uh, parishioners, uh, Christina Maxwell has just been promoted to our resource manager, and she kind of over, she's in the position of overseeing all the food that comes in and making sure that it goes to the right place. And, you know, does the kitchen know that we got a pallet of broccoli and what are we going to do with it? And making sure that the pantry knows, like, you're going to get half of this to go out in pantry and half of it's going to the kitchen. So... We serve breakfast and lunch from the 8.30 to 10.30 time slot. And then if people, <clears throat> for dinner, um, if they stay in the day center, they serve dinner. Salvation Army serves dinner. And John 3.16 serves dinner um, for anyone. You don't have to stay there. So that's kind of the eating options. Yes, Tammy. So there is actually a mobile grocery truck. Um, it's a group called RG, and I think it seems for really good <laughs> groceries, and they do that. I don't know, and they do go to some um, housing developments, uh, you know, the different uh, housing places. And then um, South 
Tulsa Community House is, an, is a resource for them. And then the thing that I did not mention for Grocery Pantry, I've got two minutes, is um, we uh, partner with other social service agencies, so case managers and things like that. If they have clients that can't come to Iron Gate, they take the groceries to them. Um, we have a pilot program with DoorDash where we're dashing groceries right now. Um, it's set to expire in June, but we're looking at other options how we can maybe do that because we definitely know we have people that it's hard for them to get to Iron Gate and, you know, people who take the bus. I mean, can you imagine taking the bus like three stops to come get like all these groceries and then trying to get them home? So, yeah, we're definitely looking at that with other partners on how we can go to these places where there isn't there are food deserts. So, um, Christina, <laughs> you can you can always call me, but I'll, I'll or I'll refer it to Christina. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So absolutely, and we have a link. They can sign up. They can yeah. So okay, I'm wrapping up. Anything else? Thank you all so much for letting me. I get a little crazy when I start talking, and I can't. Uh, being a great audience and for all your support great job Carrie thank you just a little audience participation if you've ever helped on the food line or in the kitchen area packing raise your hands I just want to see it's a pretty good group now one more participation if you've ever given to Iron Gate or attended one of the dinners raise your hand so you know Chris Buzzard and I have seen this organization over the last 40 some odd years and for the first 30 years it was hand to mouth how are we going to make it but it's 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 a god thing that always the right person came along we've had some great directors but this lady is the finest we've ever had and then also the debt thing was was um, always there until this class got involved and iron gate would not be what it is without mike and leslie moore and tom maxwell who built that building <laughs> debt-free, under budget, uh, and took us to, to new heights where there's no debt, yep. financially pretty dead gum stable. So uh, <laughs> keep up the fine work. Thank you. Mm.